So welcome everybody. It's uh, 7.30 here in Vienna, Austria, and welcome to this session of Meta Science Conference 21. It's uh, a session on the communication of open science, which is maybe more uh, an epistemological dimension of meta science. Uh, and uh, here, especially today, we want to speak about uh, lessons learned during this ongoing pandemic. Uh, with uh, the, the major shift towards more openness in research and open science activities. So uh, before the pandemic, if you like, um, the, those activities were mostly discussed within academia, such as preprints or open access. But now they came to uh, public attention and some of them provided uh, several grounds for controversy around communication and trust of scientific authority and evidence. So these controversies, on the other hand, uh, laid open the stage to observe how policymakers, for example, or public discourse in more general, uh, were integrating scientific knowledge in the making, thus knowledge that comes with a lot of uncertainty. And on this roundtable today, we are gathering today for dear colleagues um, to discuss exactly this issue, how to best open and communicate knowledge in the making how to deal with uncertainty stemming from real-time science that has to answer societal challenges in an open way. So hello to my colleagues. Uh, we all met as mentors and fellows during the five-year fellowship uh, program, Freies Wissen, uh, free knowledge or open knowledge uh, translated, hosted by the Wikimedia Germany uh, Foundation, which had the aim to foster open science among interdisciplinary early career researchers. And I guess uh, you agree with me, it was a lot of fun. It was an outstanding experience. And so uh, we also wrote uh, some uh, things together. I, we prepared a link uh, for an article that we prepared, uh, uh, that we wrote together. We, I would put it later into the chat. And so, uh, yeah, welcome on this virtual stage, uh, Nate, Nate Brenzau, uh, a sociologist uh, currently at the University of Bremen in Germany. Hi, Nate. Uh, Jana Lasser, uh, a computational social scientist uh, at uh, Graz University of Technology and also the Complexity Science Hub in Vienna. Hi, Jana, in Austria. Uh, and then we have uh, Tamara Heck uh, uh, and uh, Silvia Kuhlmann. Both of you are education and information researchers at the Leibniz Institute for Research and Information in Education in Germany. So hello, uh, Tamara. Hello, Silvia. And my name is Katja Meyer, and I uh, come from Science and Technology Studies at the University of Vienna in Austria. So we do not have any slides. Uh, as I said, we'll post relevant links to the chat while we speak. Um, and the idea for this one hour session is first to discuss on the panel two questions and then lead an open discussion with the audience uh, about the lessons learned from opening research activities in the making in times of a global pandemic. So please use the chat also for your questions, use chat or Q&A. And uh, uh, we, I, I would, if there are no further uh, questions, I would like to immediately come to the first question that we have prepared to ourselves uh, to answer, uh, to kind of trigger the debate a little bit. And, and this first question uh, on the round table is uh, to you, my colleagues. Uh, so you all experienced uh, struggles to, uh, and controversies in your own research, uh, making it open but also uh, in, in kind of opening of research um, in the public more generally. And I think it would be great to start if you could give an example of such a controversy and elaborate a bit why you think those forms of research openness lead to these controversial reactions. And uh, Sylvia, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Katja, for this very nice introduction. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you all today. Um, yeah, I have an example, a very interesting one, I think. Um, let's start with Heinsberg. Uh, maybe somebody of you heard already of Heinsberg. It's, um, yeah, it's about openness that is, uh, as far as I know, very unique and with regard to the communication of scientific results to the public, yeah, special. Um, especially, uh, it's a source of many controversial reactions um, in both worlds, in science and in public. Yeah, first of all, a few words about back background. Um, the setting is COVID in the beginning of 2020. 
in a small village near Heinsberg in Germany. It's um, located in a rural area of North Rhine-Westphalia. And yeah, every year uh, the whole of North Rhine-Westphalia celebrates Carnival with great enthusiasm. And it's uh, given the same importance, I think, uh, to the ones in Venice and Brazil. It's really uh, famous there. Uh, yeah, and in February 2020, we now all know that most things concerning COVID were unclear and nobody of us, I think, could have um, ever imagined what would uh, have happened in the upcoming months. Uh, because of its social relevance, um, this is important, all carnival events took place in Heinsberg and all over Germany, but in Heinsberg as well, uh, regardless of COVID. And uh, unfortunately, one of the happy parties there uh, turned out to be a so-called super spreader event. And as a result, um, a huge number of people were tested positive there. And Heinsberg will therefore definitely go down in history as uh, the first great uh, COVID out outbreak in Germany. Um, yeah, scientists, that is a bad side. And now scientists immediately immediately uh, took advantage of this opportunity and they used the district as a, a kind of a case study um, in this uncertain phase of this uh, emergent pandemic. It, it wasn't a pandemic at that point of time, but it was emerging and yeah, it happened in the end. It, um, this was on this place, Heinsberg was considered to be um, perfect to study the behavior of the virus um, in detail. And so a group of scientists following Hendrik Streeck, this is a famous German virologist and an I HIV researcher. Um, he started a COVID research project there, and uh, this was funded by the government of North Rhine-Westphalia in the main part. And a part of his strategy was to test nearly every resident uh, for the virus, and Strieck um, tried to apply the results there to the whole of Germany. I could now speak hours about all the questions and uncertainties um, that have been discussed publicly uh, by other scientists regarding the Heinsberg study, but um, uh, this is not uh, what I want to focus on um, today. Um, I'm um, interested in the whole of the research and how it was uh, communicated to the public. And this was really, really special and unique, I think, um, because for the first time, as far as I know, a PR agency uh, was used to present the project. Uh, Strick engaged a story machine. This is a company which is funded by Kai Diekmann. And, and this man is a former editor of the German yellow press newspaper Bild, which is quite famous in Germany. And uh, he explained that he wanted to document the work of his team and show how science works. Um, and one of the most important goals, he stated, was to make everything transparent and clear to the public. Uh, and uh, the documentation was also done, or was done in social media in main parts uh, under the term the Heinsberg, the Heinsberg Protocol, the Heinsberg Protocol. Maybe some of you heard of that. Um, yeah, at the same time, and this is very interesting at this point, uh, the Prime Minister of North Rhine-Westphalia, it's Armin Laschet, he's currently running for the position of the German Chancellor in elections here in Germany on Sunday. Um, he strongly encouraged um, the lifting of lockdown, and um, he did that during a press conference in uh, spring 2020. And at the same time, at this press conference, Streeck and his team presented uh, the intermediate results of um, the performed study. Um, in the aftermath of all that, uh, more and more details uh, regarding the work of story machine um, came to light. And what was here particularly interesting, uh, that was the fact um, that story machine had developed a very sophisticated communication concept, um, especially for facts that spoke in favor um, of ending the lockdown. And yeah, well, this of course may raised many, many questions. Uh, among these, uh, who financed the work of Story Machine, for example. Additionally, um, it was also questioned if the results of such a project um, were reliable when it was funded by government that wanted strongly to uh, release COVID uh, restrictions. And at the same time, the same project was promoted by a PR agency, which was headed by a former yellow press uh, journalist renowned for influence and reporting. Um, yeah, it, in, in the end, it was questioned if this is a kind um, of contracted research uh, in the sense of uh, payment for desired results. Um, yeah, another point is, uh, yeah, one could argue that uh, we face here an example of, of open washing, which is uh, when the whole project uh, and its results uh, are promoted as open science, but it's actually the opposite. And unfortunately, and this is the, the big point, um, all this, the whole affair um, has thrown a bad light on science as a whole in Germany. Um, 
many non-scientists, and I experienced that in personal talks as well, um, have asked themselves if they can really trust these um, highly educated people in science and in politics, um, or if they were making uh, fools of them. And this is, um, I think, really a big problem that we face here with this um, affair. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, and very big starting uh, example of what can go wrong. Uh, you mentioned open washing already, but then of course we are settled in a in a time where there is conflicting uh, interests, but also uh, facts are uh, not very certain. So there are a lot of uh, diverging facts. Uh, we don't have a lot of information about what's going on, and then of course this uh, can um, yeah. Uh, put a, a bad light on science as it is then regarded as science by press conference and especially by people that know how to change public opinion that that are very professional and uh, you can co cover it from both sides right it can be actually a good move to have people who know uh, to deal with public opinion uh, on, on the grand scale in such processes, but maybe not in that constellation, yeah. But then anyway, so so diverging facts, right, is also a big problem, uh, not being sure what information is the right one. And uh, so who, who wants to, to, to add another example uh, now, maybe Nate? Yeah, I think I could just comment. Um... And I still haven't decided is the best translation open washing or open laundering. Laundering sounds more sinister in English, maybe. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, to exploit the idea of open science. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in this, there was more intention because there was this story machine, this PR thing going on. I think in, in the US, early on, we, we see an interesting case where there was maybe not much intention and maybe not a lot of organization. And so things, and we're talking about why the public sort of can react with a lot of mistrust suddenly or develop this mistrust, right? And, um, you know, the, the CDC uh, got the, the, the gene sequences for testing were available really early. And so the CDC um, tried to produce test kits and really kind of botched this effort. And um, at some level, that should be OK. That should also be part of open science and open communication. Like, there will be mistakes. There will be you know, x percentage of null hypotheses rejected, even though they're true, et cetera, right? But um, they, they didn't really take good responsibility for that. It was just like, oh, you know, the, te the test kits don't work. And, and um, and then there was this mask and no mask. This, this was in a lot of countries too. I, I'm just sort of using the US as an example, but it was kind of like, oh, you don't need to wear a mask. Yes, you do need to wear a mask. And there was not a lot of information behind these decisions. The decisions would just kind of happen. Um, and, and, it, and it happened again recently with vaccinated people need to wear a mask, don't need to wear a mask, need to wear a mask. Um, and I, I think that uh, part of, part of the problem was just sort of this, this lack of taking responsibility, right? So it's just like the public could have the impression that, oh, every week they're just kind of saying a new thing. And um, this, this really leads to sort of an evaporation of trust. And especially when, if there's a mistake made, you know, why, why was it made, you know? And again, in, in the communication direction, mistakes are part of science and that, that you know, the politicians sort of want to hang somebody for a mistake. Okay, that's sort of normal politics, but mistakes are part of science. And so taking responsibility for them simply just means what happened, you know, that, that this is part of the scientific process. But I think there was a, a lot of mistrust really early on. And of course, we won't turn this into a panel on politics, but in the German case, in the in the Heinsberg study, when Streeck had this this um, this this science by press conference, literally in a press conference, you know, the politicians are there. And in the U.S. example, I mean, we had these daily um, press conferences, and the politicians were there. And often the information was conflicting. You know, the the scientists would say one thing, the politicians would say another thing, and the, even the media might say a third thing. So no wonder the public had trouble trusting in this case. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's also a very good example of how important it is to discuss now uh, 
maybe better channels of communication dealing with um, knowledge that is not uh, finished, that is uh, in the making. And one particular uh, example, for example, have been preprints, right? Uh, uh, suddenly they uh, uh, produced a rush into science from people from non-scientists or maybe scientists from other domains to try to find out about the situation. For example, the mask and no mask thing. I mean, they were conflicting uh, uh, and diverging scientific papers on that too, right? So there was a lot of different evidence. So yeah, maybe we can go on a little bit more in this direction. And maybe Tamara, you, you want to add something here? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I uh, I want to give an example with uh, specifically the, the preprints uh, in research, and it might have been a research intern conflict before COVID only, so only research intern because we had preprint servers before COVID, and um, in different disciplines, not our all disciplines, there are great differences, I think. Um, but we had them, and the preprints um, are generally not peer reviewed. Um, and when COVID started, the, the preprints, as Katya already said, preprints and even this um, peer review process got into public and um, people um, yeah, got, got known about those uh, in the media. And I had the feeling, and that was my intention toward uh, this kind of um, um, paper about the uh, lessons learned. Um, I had the feeling that the media um, reported about the preprints kind of negatively. And that the um, that some people reported to me, oh, it's it's not it's bad research. It's just a preprint. Why are the researchers doing this? Um, and um, this I find this where we said because this uh, preprints is a, are uh, the thing um, that leads to or that belongs to the open science practice uh, practices in my opinion. So you can publish your results um, as early um, as possible, and you can share it with. The intention, main intention is to share it with the researchers. You put it on a preprint server and uh, other researchers um, can read it, can give feedback, can peer review it, maybe uh, even uh, openly peer reviewing it. Though that's a positive thing on the first hand. Um, but the other thing we have, um, and this got in the public as well during COVID, is um, that we don't have this quality check. And the peer reviewing is an, um, a process and research to check and to prove the quality of research. Um, and it might be, so preprints and peer review might be a bit of contradictive, though they don't, um, yeah, they don't go together either you do preprint first or you you're getting a peer reviewed first and and submit your your paper for example to a traditional uh, publisher to a journal so both processes either peer reviewing or preprint have their pros and cons so either you you share um, your knowledge as early as possible or you do the quality check first and um, th this might be in a research intern conflict but in the public um, the public didn't know about those processes within research. And so it was rather seen negatively, um, those processes. And um, I'm not sure if the public was uh, understood what, what's behind this uh, idea of, of preprints and sharing research. And uh, might be an example for, uh, for my experience. So what, what does a researcher do now to, to do open practices? Uh, we recently uploaded a preprint. We had some. Uh, study and with include some code and we uploaded this as a preprint the article um, at the same time we did the submission um, submitted the article to a traditional journal so we did it in, in parallel um, the journal's peer review was very quick uh, not where we um, it was comprehensive but it was quick and it criticized that the code had some some error and the article was rejected um, without any discussion, this is. And, but at the same time, luckily, we received a kind of open peer review at our preprint. Um, and a colleague told us, um, or detected the, co the code error as well, and uh, suggested a solution. And um, yeah, we, we um, changed the code and, and uh, yeah, could, could, um, could publish the, the right code and, um, did a re-editing our article so we got a positive feedback and um, it, I guess it's even good because the research of this open peer review um, even can get some acknowledgement because you can see um, her um, corrections online uh, with the preprint and for me that's a possible um, 
positive experience. So yeah, it can so, go together. Yeah, and it would be necessary also to maybe uh, train the media also a little bit more on these uh, processes that happen in science and, and how uh, um, knowledge is produced and how it is kind of uh, legitimized as well and how it is uh, proved. Um, so I think those things are really important. But then on the other hand, and I remember what Jana, you told us when we met first to discuss this panel, then on the other hand, why it, you have to be really careful with opening up your research uh, in the making, especially when you deal with, um, uh, for example, uh, measures around COVID simulating different policy measures and their effects on society. And there, uh, your, your research, even if it's not finished and not everything is kind of super uh, tightly uh, and robust um, uh, peer reviewed, uh, there is a need to, to kind of uh, constantly develop this knowledge also to help uh, policymakers if they want to uh, hear and listen to this evidence. But uh, then also, if you publish those things in preprints, for example, but also in other formats, this might have a huge impact on uh, on society and on the policy me policy measures uh, themselves. So I remember, Jana, you were telling us a little bit about this. So maybe you want to elaborate here as well your experiences in that regard. Jana, we have a very strange noise uh, on your on your mic. Maybe you you can try again. There's like a whisper. Yeah, it's not really working. It's like a really weird feedback. Now? No, it's, it's getting more alien, more and more alien. And more alien. Like, ah, uh, now it works. Now it works. Yes, okay. very well. The third microphone. Okay. <laughs> well, sorry about that. <laughs> we tested, but apparently not enough. Um, so yeah, just tell me when it becomes alien again. Um, all right. So I guess what I can contribute to this discussion is kind of the inside perspective from the early COVID crisis research. Um, back in early March 2020, we were sitting at the Complexity Science Hub doing our usual research stuff. And then this, this COVID thing started brewing. And one afternoon in the office, um, we started making projections for Austria. So basically we, what we did is we looked at the case numbers and when we did an ex extrapolation uh, into the future, assuming exponential growth, what, that's what you assume for growth of a pandemic. And we had uh, the numbers from Italy, who, which, which already had this huge outbreak. So the numbers for uh, the percentage of people being hospitalized and the percentage of people dying, which were rather high um, in Italy because the hospital system there was, was overwhelmed very early on. And our projection showed that um, basically end of April, um, the Austrian uh, intensive care capacities would be exhausted. And after that, people would start dying uh, in the thousands. And we were sitting there looking at this projection. It was just a simple plot. It was basically a straight line uh, of the projected case numbers crossing a horizontal line that indicated the ICU capacity. We were like, okay, what do we do with this? Like, if we go public with this, there is a high chance to ca cause a panic because people will be like, oh my God, we're going to die one month from now and we will buy lots of toilet paper before that. Um, and on the other hand, we were like, but we need to show this um, at least to the politicians so they can act because at that point in time, nobody was acting in Austria. And we were discussing back and forth, like, how, how do we go about this? And also, as, as was already mentioned, I mean, the error bars on these numbers were huge. We had the numbers from Italy, but it was only Italy, right? One case, um, no average, no uncertainty. So it was very hard to like draw error bars on, on this projection. Well, and then in the end, what we decided is that, yeah, we, we just communicate this. We communicated it both to, polit to the politicians and over Twitter, which was then picked up by media. We were also not the only scientists communicating that, to be fair. And uh, yeah, we kind of overestimated our importance. Nobody panicked um, and uh, politicians acted, probably not only because of us, because of the general like uh, yeah, sentiment at the time. Um, but I think the discussion we had uh, at that point in time was very worthwhile because we, we really went through like what could happen. And then in the end, we decided that we as scientists, it's not our, our role to kind of hide this information and make this decision for the public. Um, and we decided to be as transparent as we can 
also communicating where the uncertainties are and to the best of our knowledge communicating like the the error bars of this projection and just yeah letting the public decide what to do with that then in the end so that was uh, how we resolved it for us but it was not not such an easy discussion to have I, I can imagine, and that would fit uh, uh, perfectly to the second question that we have prepared, uh, which is how can we better communicate, communicate those open research practices to the public and uh, the different sectors in the public. And I think uh, the, the, the conversation you had among your, your uh, group, uh, your research team, uh, produced uh, some interesting ways to go about this, right, uh, to, to find maybe solutions on uh, po potential uh, interfaces to this knowledge, uh, which which would be cool if you would share them with us. Yeah, um, kind of. I mean, this this kind of discussions continued for us because we were engaged in, in much more COVID research after that. And what we kind of found out for ourselves is that just being open with the data or the code is not enough. Um, it needs to be contextualized and it needs to be explained and in the best case even targeted and packaged differently for different audiences um, and that's not a trivial task that requires time and it also requires some kind of professionalism and not every researcher is cut out to do that from the get-go so uh, at the complexity science hub we were very lucky to have a visualization scientist a resident uh, visualization scientist whose uh, like research job it is to develop uh, good representations of information and that uh, person johannes sorge um, he did a great job in in creating many information products that we kind of wanted to communicate and also uh, gave us a great opportunity to kind of um, yeah, be very open about our research in a in a very accessible way. So to just give you an example, another COVID research project we had or we still have going on is, and um, we were researching the effectiveness of countermeasures in schools, and we were uh, doing that with a computer simulation where we had an agent-based model of children and teachers in schools, and we could put many different measures like masks, preventive testing, ventilation, uh, cohorting of the students into that simulation model and look at the outcomes in terms of how infections spread in that school. And obviously, as researchers, when communicating these results, we already um, make many decisions and filter the results we communicate, because if we would look at all the possible combinations of measures, there are thousands of them, and we need to pick certain combinations that we as researchers think are important to communicate them to both the policymakers and to our peers. And what we did is that we made an um, online um, visualization tool, um, our exploration tool, actually, I can link that later in the chat, where people can really start configuring their own school and then they can pick measures and then they can look at exemplary outbreaks in schools given these measures and they can also see um, the outcomes of a certain selection of measures in the context of other possible selections and while um, obviously that's not uh, really then a, a scientific outcome it's just one example but still it enables people to like see for themselves what is possible in that simulation and what different combinations are there um, and with that, we hoped to like make that more accessible. And we also hoped actually um, to use it in a kind of um, pedagogical context in schools so that the schools and the teachers and the children themselves can, can understand like what a measure, what the effect of a measure is and how it influences uh, the infection dynamics in the school. And yeah, I think that was, was a pretty cool project, but as I already said, it was only possible because we had this professional whose job it really was to implement that with us. Uh, I couldn't have done that on my own. Yeah, and then I, if I'm allowed to share that, you told us as well that this was a side project of, of you guys, right? Uh, in the beginning, at least. Uh, that's uh, that's how I remember it, that this was not funded the way it could have been funded and that you did it because you thought it was really necessary to do. So I, I guess that is also an important fact that we have to consider that a lot of those activities, they they don't re receive the, the necessary uh not only the attention from funders, but also there are no schemes for, for activities like this, for this kind of translatory um, activities. And I think what, what one of the goals of your project were definitely um, to 
not only to give an instrument to people to to get more accommodated with this sort of information and maybe play around with it and see that there are actually options and and there are possibilities for them but it's also a measure that could in a way raise trust uh, in in those information if many people will not see it as science right they, they they will not make this translation but at least they will see it as information that is out there that can be trusted because they can handle it themselves right and and it would be great if you yeah could also study that dimension in the next time and kind of uh, in a very nice accompanying study that can show what the effects are then actually for the people that use that kind of interface but uh speaking of trust uh when when we prepared this session uh if i remember correctly um nate you you wanted to say something on that right am i am i right you wanted to add um, something there it depends. Are we on question two now? Uh, yes, that is still a question one. two. No, no, that is still that is already the question two. So how do we better communicate those re open research they, practices yeah. to the public? Because okay. there's lots to say about how mistrust happened, but we'll try to we'll try to go the positive direction. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one thing that came to light in uh, again, the US case is a good example, um, is that local um, the trust happens at often more at a local level. So, it's, you know, maybe some of us are more international and moving around and whatnot, but a lot of people are really attached to the place where they live and work and have a doctor and that kind of thing. And so this trust really happens. They may be more likely to trust what their doctor says or even what somebody at the supermarket says than what they see on TV or what the, you know, president or chancellor says. And, um, that would suggest that if there was a way to target those people, people who are kind of, I don't know if you could call them local influencers, and if there was a way to find them, but if there would be a way to kind of get to those people and, and try to communicate um, about open research practices, about what, what, what it means, you know, how can we understand um, things like the huge error that, that Jana was talking about in these predictions, how, how can we process that and, and how can we you know, rely on the data that's being shown to us? I think that would be an interesting opportunity. I'm not aware of any um, specific targeted attempts to do that. I know that in Germany, um, they, they wanted to have all the local doctors become vaccinators. And this created a lot of chaos because um, many local doctors were really just not equipped to do that. And so, you know, you can see how someone who's in that position would then maybe start to take a different position on the whole pandemic in general, just because they're like, oh my gosh, I, I can't be vaccinating all of my patients here in my little local family, you know, practice. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And maybe, maybe I'll pass it on for others who want to jump in and come back in with other ideas later to make more of a yeah, Tamara, you want to add something here? Yeah, yeah thanks, Nate. I guess your um, your example with the the lo um, local people and and the trust is um, is very good. And I have um, one related example from this from our fellow program. Uh, and my mentee, um, she has a had a research um, project and was asking herself how to communicate. Um, research results on uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease um, to, to the people and to the, um, to the families um, who were affected. And um, she kind of wanted to talk to self-help groups. At the end, she had to, to, to make a survey because of, of COVID, she couldn't go to them. But um, anyway, what came out is that um, people, she, she expected to, um, that the, the relatives of, of those um, the people or the self-help groups that they um, wanted to have um, informative websites or something and she wanted to do something with um, wiki uh, media and, and and those platforms and but what they reported is that they liked the the personal um, uh, environment and the sharing of information in their group and what they um, wanted was a kind of uh, yeah the, the research that researchers would come to them and just talk to them um, personally so they they um, yeah, they appreciated this this local um, this trust of this group, and and didn't want or they, they couldn't imagine any to getting any better inform health information uh, online or via a research communication tool as as we established, for example. 
Yeah, I can imagine. Do you have a do you have, have a link to this project uh, by your uh, fellow? Uh, yeah, I put the link. Inside, yeah, this yeah. would be great. Yeah, this would be great. Uh, Sylvia, do you like to give an example here too? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> It's always the same, the microphone, thank you. <laughs> um, but what came to my mind is um, the possibility to communicate, communicate open educational, uh, open, open science practices and to bring it uh, to a broader audience. Um, I think open educational resources um, could be a possibility for promoting these practices. Um, maybe for those who never heard of open education resources, I just give a short introduction. They are openly licensed teaching and learning materials um, for which a creator um, allows everybody to reuse and re revise them um, and also to adapt them to other learning contexts and that all without cost. And um, yeah, if anybody is interested in, uh, interested in that format, um, please let us know. Um, and OER, from my point of view, can give um, yeah, an excellent contribution to scientists by training in open science, um, but as well to, to lay people, um, I think. And there are um, some courses out there already in the web, um, which everybody can, can access and use. And I think um, in addition to these quite complex OER, which, which are focusing on a scientific audience, um, uh, there could be uh, developed uh, formats like, like short videos, flyers, or the material for schools, etc., which are tailored uh, to a non-scientific audience. I think this, this would be a good, good idea and a good thought and it could bring um, everything forward, especially to, to bring scientific literacy, literacy to, to, uh, yeah, to a non-scientific audience, which would really help in that context, I suppose. Yeah, so so I, I I think we have kind of assembled a lot of uh, different uh, positions here, and uh, uh, examples. And now we would like to open the floor to the questions of the audience and comments. And maybe also somebody wants to share with 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 us all uh, his or her experiences of uh, and maybe also lessons learned in making uh, your research open in times of a pandemic or in general uh, how to deal with the uncertainty of uh, research in the making while communicating it to the public. So at the moment I don't see any uh, questions in the Q&A but maybe some will come. Uh, Nate, yes please. While we're waiting for a question, I, I would also add the, um, the skeptics position. Someone should take it. Um, and it is that there are certain aspects of this that I, I might label insurmountable. Um, and and, and two, two in particular are, uh, for example, it, well, one is the media. And there are certain things in the United States, again, the US case, I, I know somewhat well, in 1985, we had this FCC fairness doctrine overturned, which basically meant that media, news, news media could say anything they want as a fact and say anything they want as news without providing alternative perspectives. So it, it really kind of introduced the heyday of like what we tend to call fake news today. Um, and this is something that is embedded and very hard to overcome. And the other thing is, the, like Jana was saying earlier, the type of communication may need to be tailored to, to the type of audience. I think that's a really important point, but in some audiences may be unreachable. And again, in the US case, there is definitely a large number of people who are identify as Republican who when the science discussion comes up, they believe that it is propaganda. So they, they, they see it as propaganda. This, this isn't a, this isn't a, I'm just not a political criticism of anything. It's just a, it's a hurdle that is really hard to overcome. Cause as soon as, it, oh, let me tell you about the science behind it. Oh no, that's, that's some kind of, um, you know, liberal propaganda. So these are things that um, I'm certainly open to hearing ideas but I find them to be potentially insurmountable hurdles in this effort. 
Sorry for being the negative skeptic. No, no, I think that's really important. That it was also the first example by Sylvia, no, that the science by press conference doesn't really help exactly, exactly when there are a lot of uh, skeptics out there. Um, so let me just check. There is a question now by uh, Stephen Pinfield. Uh, who says the general tone of the discussion has been negative. Can anyone quote positive examples of communication of science in the pandemic? Oh, uh, which could perhaps be used as exemplars for future practice. Well, I have to say, uh, I, I don't see it that way. I think we have given uh, some nice examples. Uh, for example, um, um, the, 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 the visual interface uh, uh, that Jana has uh, provided. Uh, we posted a link in there in the chat, but also some of the opportunities that come with uh, open peer review, especially in times of a uh, pandemic. So, uh, but maybe some others want to, to add even more positive examples. Uh, I, I, before this uh, question came, I was uh, I in, just intended to uh, even post a link to more skeptics, and I do it now, uh, a list that uh, was uh, or issues that are defined by a group of scientists that um, uh, also observed uh, some quite uh, yeah, uh, concerning uh, tendencies, especially by big publishing houses and, and big high impact journals in the time, but let's not go too much into these uh, details now. So does any one of the panelists want to add a more positive stance? Yes, Tamara? Maybe a positive example that um, is that how I experience it that way that we we learned. So, for example, um, the researchers they um, communicated openly from the COVID research, and the media learned that there are more than one uh, expert uh, they could ask. So it got more diverse in the in the public discussions. And what I experienced, which I um, and I think that's a good. Um, practice now that media is citing the original research more often even in the in the um, daily news so that they have a direct link to to the research and if it's a preprint or if it's open access it is even readable by the public immediately and that's that's great i think that's a good practice um to even yeah to to lead, that lead, will lead to more trust yeah there, there's also a point uh, brought up by Veronique Kirma in the Q&A, and I think that is also actually uh, tending to be a positive example. Uh, well, the question is, do the panelists have any experiences with organizations like Sideline in the US or equivalent organizations worldwide who are providing context and expert opinions on newly published articles and preprints to support journalists who report on scientific advances? I, I, me personally, I don't have experiences, but I, I think that these kind of services exist and that also these kind of services are there to, for example, review a lot of scientific papers published and this is also a sort of meta science, right? And then uh, publish their, these results. Open access is also a very good um, um, movement towards more uh, uh, openness and better communication. But maybe the panelists want to say something here. Uh, do you have any experiences with uh, these kind of translation processes uh, to be more general? Anybody wants to say something here? Journalists, experiences with with kind of translating particular information to journalists. Jana? I, I can comment on that, but sadly not in a positive way. So no, I do not have experience with something like Sideline. I think it would be great to have it in Europe or I don't know, in the German speaking news sphere. Um, because what I experienced, and I had some contact with journalists, but actually my, my uh, boss at the time, Peter Schimek had way more uh, interaction with journalists that the, in, the intention of the journalists focused on a very select number of people. Uh, and they kept asking those people um, for COVID related things, even if they weren't really the experts. So just to give a personal example, I did all this research on schools and then a journalist contacted me and asked me like if I could comment on the effectiveness of antigen tests and their sensitivity. And sadly, I had to say, look, I'm a computational scientist, not a microbiologist or a molecular bi biologist. I can't really comment on that. And I did that a couple of times. And after that, they stopped contacting me at all. But there were other people who, who commented, uh, even though the science was way outside their fields. And so I think uh, 
it led to a like very narrow perspective from science. There was only a handful of voices, maybe 10 scientists in total that were present in the media, um, but there could have been so many more um, that were true experts on the different subtopics. So I would really welcome if a platform that kind of manages the um, contributions of scientists and the attention of journalists existed, because I know how this uh, like narrowing of perspectives arises because it's just easier to access the people you already know and you know that will reply to your emails. And journalists have a great deal of pressure. They need to work fast and they need to reach people fast. So they kind of go the low risk way and go for the people they already know how to work with. So yeah, I, I would really welcome a bit more diverse perspectives here. Anybody else from the panel who wants to comment on that point? Not immediately. Mm -hmm. Well, but yeah, maybe I, I don't have any experiences with them as well, but um, maybe that's a good, um, some of the lessons learned that we need, uh, even as researchers need to know some of the, how the media works, how the people work there, how they do their daily um, practice and work um, to, to understand what, um, yeah, what, what Jana said, I worked as a journalist and I, uh, I can agree you, you have a time pressure and you need to, to reach out to, to people immediately. Um, so that's, that's a work. And maybe, um, in future we could think of new, uh, for example, digital platforms or kind of, of tools that facilitate maybe this, um, or this example by the, um, or PA is a good example that facilitates the communication between both the, the media and the researchers. Um, but I guess I think that that we need this um, communication to um, yeah to talk and communicate research results and, and give information to the public. Well, without being too negative, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, I have to say that unfortunately, uh, what we see in the media is the tendency to cut uh, uh, science journalism totally, right? So in, in most of the big newspapers in, in Europe, there is no, no space anymore for science journalism. And uh, and many of the science journalists have long uh, left the field to, to kind of move more towards uh, consulting and so on, because there is just no money in the system for more detailed and and, and uh, yeah, uh, special reporting on science for this translation, I would say. So now what we have is we have a lot of, let's call them normal journalists, like daily business journalists who have to deal with science as well. And for them, it's also hard to do so. So I think uh, these, as we said before, I mean, there, there need to be much more funding opportunities in, for, for exactly this translation uh, processes and uh, media science is one, but then of course, uh, science to other sectors uh, in society is uh, many others. And what, what, what the problem here could be is that that uh, we will be uh, too late, right? Because when people talk about preparedness, that is the, the new term that always comes up when science policy interfaces are uh, debated in, in kind of in, in, in relation to big societal challenges, also the climate crisis, for example, uh, that uh, one big pillar of this preparedness would be exactly these translation processes that uh, most of the time have no funding at all or happen uh, as a side project, as a personal interest of people uh, to do so. So I guess that is really a big problem. And and I don't know, uh, today I, I saw many funders here at this conference, maybe they should also take this more into account that this is really important uh, in order to, for the, for the well-being of society and for the social impact of research. To, to fund more of those activities. Are there any other questions from the audience? I will have to check in the chat, but but I don't know. There is, uh, at the moment, I don't see any, but we we only have uh, 12 minutes left. So, so maybe we kind of slowly wrap it up. And uh, so uh, I guess now, Okay, we have been a little bit negative, but we have tried also to bring up uh, the positive side of it and the the opportunities that there are, and there are so many opportunities uh, with with open science, and uh, to to kind of 
make not to educate or teach the public but to kind of reach out and engage with the public like science in society and not science to society because science is embedded in society of course and so i would like to ask the panelists for like one last round of uh, what would be now your priority or where would you like to uh, put a wish I don't know how you say this in English, but uh, where you, what would be your wish for uh, a better communication of science in the making and open science um, in in the near future? So uh, I don't know who wants to who wants to go first. Yeah, Silvia? maybe. Yeah. I Okay. Yeah, maybe I should start. Um, yes, my wish is um, that uh, scientific literacy uh, would increase in, in in the public as well, so that the communication can yeah can can be uh, positive and uh, productive in the future, that everybody understands how science works and science can explain itself um, good to the public because of that. Okay, thanks. Jana, you wanted to go before. Want to be next? <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate the point I already made. Um, I think that the professionalization of science communication is really helpful um, for, for this process. So if people are there, they're actually trained and paid for doing this, uh, have some time to do it and can translate between what scientists say and what the public can understand. Um, and I, I mean, I think especially in Germany, it looks like this is slowly happening and that science communication is becoming like a profession, a proper profession, and it become, it gets the attention and probably also the resources it deserves. Um, and I can just say for, from experience that it's, it's really helpful to work with somebody who had, has learned how to do this. And it's really, it really adds something um, and it makes the, the communication more reliable because you might find uh, the odd scientist who has a knack for doing it and who also likes it, but this is a, then a very lucky find and you can't expect to have somebody like that in, in your institution. So he said, if there are funders around, maybe, uh, yeah, think about allocating some funding to the science communicator. Thank you, Jana. So there are coming some comments now in the Q&A and uh, um, maybe I kind of uh, put them in now before uh, I let uh, Nate and Tamara say their last sentence, if that is okay. Um, so um, there is, um, uh, there was, ah, it's gone now uh, because somebody answered it. So there was this hint that in, in Latin America, uh, most uh, like 70% of its research is published or open access, yes, for a very long time. And I guess we are all aware of this. So we always, I mean, in my in my talks and presentations, I always use Latin America as a, as a pioneer and good example, best practice. But that doesn't necessarily, when everything is open access, that doesn't necessarily solve the problem that the knowledge has to be translated, right? So it's a very important first step, <coughs> sorry but it's not um, the solution to for for broader public engagement with science i guess so that is that is really important and i see that nate you have answered um and then there is uh Jaron. <coughs> sorry very in the netherlands there was some success in changing the thinking about preprints among influential science journalists awareness has grown of the aspects of standing and status of preprints so yeah i think this is a, a really good example what you can do when you do some targeted uh, campaigns or actions on that and now i'm losing my voice so maybe nate or tamara you wanna jump in here sure i'll give tamara the last word if that's okay um, yeah, I think, uh, okay, so my, my ideal, it comes a little bit from Jana's example and, and in general about communicating uh, reliability or communicating error, because we also, as um, scientists, uh, communication isn't, is something we need to all develop, but it's also something that we have our limits, right? We, we could as we could spend so much time developing communication strategies that we don't spend enough time on science, for example. So it would be great to have specialists that can pick this up and do it for us. But I think one thing that we could really sort of harp on is when we have these errors, these confidence intervals, to always present them and 
maybe point in the in the direction of the worst case scenarios you know the worst case scenarios in this direction right and say this doesn't mean it will happen but it could it's possible and it's you know it's you know and there's a this range and again you know we've seen these publications recently like this this book noise by Kahneman and colleagues and that, that when different people look at the same data they're going to come to different conclusions Right, and so we can think of politicians like these people, and when they decide to make policy, you know, it, it was—I don't know—was it just luck or whatever that in Germany, for example, the national government didn't really follow this science by press conference direction and said, no, 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 we're we are not going to like open everything up. And Germany, at least until October, was a was quite a good example of of preventing spread, uh, relative, you know, relative good example. And so I assume that some of this had to do with looking at the sort of worst case scenario projections and thinking, wow, let's just make sure that doesn't happen. So good, good ideas. And I agree uh, um, to all of them with uh, what you said. Uh, maybe to, to add on this, what, what I think then it's important is to, um, to start to train uh, our researchers on maybe not the researchers, but maybe go step back and, and even start in, in higher education with our students, um, for example, to, to be open to, um, I don't know, to, to report or talk about some, some errors or so. I just recently, uh, I have my students and they're writing their, their thesis um, right now and they have a deadline next week. And uh, last week there was some student coming coming up to me and saying, oh, there's been something wrong with our uh, user study, I guess with the recording, uh, should we write this, this down in our in our thesis? Um, and I said, yes, that's that's good practice. So just report on how it, on the process and how, what went wrong and, and how, it, how it went. And then it's transparent and then I can, um, I know what, what's going on. So, um, so the, the training of our future researchers, um, maybe even in, with more open practices in, in higher education and in our teaching and maybe for example, letting students um, create teaching or research materials on their own and, and communicate this to, to, to practice this, um, this sharing and this openness on, on transparency. I guess that will as well, um, influence and be good to, to foster open science practices. Well, thank you very much for your comments. So since we still have a little bit of time, I allow myself to add a comment and to look into the chat because there are some points here and in the Q&A now coming. So uh, I, I take first the Q&A. There is a message from Bianca Kramer from Uni Utrecht. An idea I found very intriguing was the short online course, Epidemiology uh, 101 offered at McGill University, especially for science journalists. That is a really good example. What I will do is I will, um, take the link and post it into the chat because I don't think um, people can see the Q&A, uh, probably, I don't know if you guys can see that. But um, I think in general, it, it, it will be really important to deal with, uh, to understand that dealing with scientific knowledge has to be more part of the general digital media literacy, right? And, um, and, and this has to be taught much more in schools. And, um, there are other comments here. So um, uh, Jaron Bosman says, in my view, it's also important as scientists to interact with social uh, socials of mainstream media and give them constructive feedback. Yeah, it's, it's important. So sometimes it's not enough to just uh, talk to them and kind of throw your knowledge on them, but it's, you also have the responsibilities to stay with your knowledge and kind of follow what happens with it, right? So that is, this is a really good uh, uh, last word, actually, I think. And I think we should all uh, keep this in mind that we also have the responsibility for the knowledge that we produce. And it would be really cool if uh, we would also get a little bit more funding on, on these dimensions in order to increase the preparedness at these so important interfaces of science and policy, but also science and society more general. So um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think um, if there are no more questions, we are pretty much on time. Um, anybody, there, I, there are those 
channels, uh, the, the Remo and the Slack. So I, I haven't been there now because I, I uh, had no time, but I will go there soon. So we can stay in touch there on, on the topics. Thank you for this lively discussion, for your comments and questions. And thank you to Meta Science. I think it's a brilliant conference. Um, uh, thank you, Tamara, for uh, making me aware of this conference because I, I didn't know of this conference before. Uh, uh, and thanks also to Wikimedia uh, for their outstanding five year long uh, program, Free Knowledge, Freies Wissen, which was an outstanding experience uh, to be part of for me and I guess also for the others on this panel. And uh, yeah, so I, I guess we are closing this now. And and we can say goodbye and hopefully um, see you soon in another context. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katya, for your moderation. And thanks to all the participants. Bye.